Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman here, as always, with Tom or Tom. How's it going? Tony, it's great. Just spent the beautiful uh, Sunday afternoon and morning watching my son play third and fourth grade lacrosse. The event was called Lax Jam, which sounds like a, uh, it is maybe one of the most fun event names to say in the Sunday, Sunday, Sunday monster truck voice. Um, And the event was on, Tony, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. So uh, you can imagine how thrilled my wife was to be sitting next to me as this all came through my mind and I expressed it verbally. Being married to me is great. Tony, how are you? So, Tom, let me just ask you. I'm fine. Uh, were the people sitting on uh, sitting on, on their entire camping chair, or did they only need the edge of their seats? <laughs> I think we all know the answer to that, Tony. A lot of excess chair. Let's leave it at that. Good. good. Excess chair is always better than not enough chair. So that's good to know. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm doing well. While you were doing lacrosse, I had to uh, set an alarm to wake up from a nap. Sounds like we both had a really productive Sunday. That's good. That's good. So now, now we can have a really productive Sunday slash Monday as we answer some listener questions as, uh, as we love to do, because you guys, Tony, Tony asked and you guys delivered in incredible volume so much so that the Monday morning scoop is also going to be uh, answering some listener questions because you guys asked a ton of great ones. We're going to start with one from T at T Stoics. Can you explain how jersey numbers are issued? Do freshmen get to pick any number available or are certain numbers, quote unquote, earned? Well, certain numbers are certainly earned. So, some numbers are reserved or held back that you have to earn. Uh, those numbers, however, have also become recruiting tools. So you don't always need to earn it. You just need to be really good and have it be kind of a, hey, if you want 36, if you want a seven, Come here and you can have, we'll start you out with, you can wear number seven or whatever. So uh, generally, obviously, availability is the key thing. Number has to be available. And we've seen so many guys that have changed numbers over the years because you get what you get as a freshman. And then once somebody that has your number leaves, then you go and grab that number. Chris Olave was 17 originally, and then he became two. And you wait for numbers to uh, to depart. But yeah, it's like you can ask. But there, you're not ne- you're not necessarily going to get the number that you want, depending on like the the status of that number in the program. Like Paris Johnson got seventy five right away. He's not the only guy. Like they they don't they I don't think they hold seventy five in enough esteem at Ohio State. So, um, but also having Paris Johnson get it is fine by me. Like that's or he's seventy seven. Sorry. I was going to uh, say Thayer yeah, Munford for 75. Thayer Munford. Yeah. yeah, so it's like that wasn't even a recruiting ploy. That was just, yeah, go ahead. If you want it, you can have it. So uh, there's some schools are different than others. Some like Texas A&M with the 12th, you know, with the number 12, that's completely different. Um, so some numbers are off limits. Others are recruiting tools like Michigan with the number one for a while was a thing. Uh, Ohio State has had you know, numbers like 2, 7, 36, although 36 it's kind of, you know, Gabe Powers has it this year. Um, it's not something that's been in high regard or, you know, un- unfortunately. But, yeah, like they can they can pick whatever they want and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll see what the availability is. And, you know, the rules can get bent at times. I mean, the, the famous story about Andy Katz and Moyer before he came to Ohio State, no one had worn 45 since Archie Griffin and 45 was going to be retired and... Then Andy Katzenmoyer wanted to wear 45, and John Cooper wanted Andy Katzenmoyer, and uh, surprise, then you could buy number 45 jerseys in the Ohio State Bookstore in the fall of 1996. Are these things related? Look, I'm not here to, uh, I'm not here to speculate on that kind of thing. So anyway, uh, you, you have guys also who, I mean, to your point, like Zach Harrison came in wearing number 33, and then switched to number 9, and then Jack Sawyer is wearing number 33. And you also have guys who are wearing numbers... Sometimes, you know, Damon Arnett went from number three to number 46 at one point, and it was like, uh, why'd you switch your number? And no one wanted to give an answer on that, which meant, hmm, he's being punished for something, and losing your single-digit jersey is viewed as a punishment. But then there are guys who are like Travion Henderson, who's wearing number 32, and it's like, oh, well, certainly he will want a single-digit number, and no, he's sticking with number 32, because that was his grandfather's number. He wears that in honor of his grandfather. So everyone kind of has their own 
you know, their own views on, on what the best number is. And some of them are easier to get than others. I, Tony, I will always, you know, number one, you mentioned Michigan, number one, that of course the tribute to the great Anthony Butterfield who wore number one in the mid nineties. But, uh, you know, to me, number one, if I was running a program, number one always goes on the biggest defensive tackle. 100% of the time that dude needs to be wearing number one, because that will look like the funniest number uh, on any Jersey on the entire roster. I don't know why more people don't do this. Uh, next one from Matt Jelko 80. Are we underestimating Dallin Hayden? A lot of talk in recruiting guys like Richard Young suggests, quote, a clear path to playing time. Well, he's obviously a stud. Hayden and Pryor will make their push too after uh, Trayvon Henderson leaves. And I, I think it's, you know, it's not that people are dismissing Dallin Hayden. It's just that if you are a five star and the guy ahead of you is a four star, you're not necessarily looking at that guy as someone who has quite as high a ceiling if you, as you do. Doesn't mean it's a hundred percent predictive. It's just, you know, a quarterback coming in the year after the number one quarterback comes in has kind of a different maybe perspective on what that depth chart might be as compared to a guy coming in the year after they bring in the 14th best quarterback in the country or something like that. And that's just, and, and there's always a question as to the mentality of the player behind that. I don't know that a five-star anything is looking at the guy ahead of him and going, well, I don't know if I can beat that guy out. Generally, if you are the type of athlete who is uh, getting to the five-star number one in your position kind of uh, conversation, you are generally not lacking for confidence and uh, not lack, you know, not, not uh, doubting yourself a whole lot. So I don't know how much that really uh, makes an impact. You know, if you come in the year after Travion Henderson, there probably is a little bit to it, though, because if, if you come in the year after Travion Henderson, well, you know Travion Henderson is on the roster and you're not going to necessarily be that dude immediately. It's a little bit potentially easier to come in and have, if you don't have a Travion Henderson the year before you, to come in and maybe at least be able to think, I might be that dude year two. Uh, first, I do need to correct you, Tom. I hate to do it. I Tyrone Butterfield, not Anthony. Obviously, Anthony Carter, you know, you know but um, I, I just didn't want us to get the letters. I wanted to hurry up and get that out there. You know, I didn't want to do this in front of everybody, but. One of the greatest players in Michigan history, and I said the wrong name. I can't, I can't believe I did that. And, uh, well, now we'll, we'll, we'll still probably get some of the other letters we're, we're going to get about that, but that's okay. That's, uh, that's fine. Well, can I, can I, can I finish? Can I, can I answer? Can I help? Can I con contribute to the show, please? Finally. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just this once. I won't make a habit of it. Let's just uh, go ahead and get this out of here. I, I think the the underestimating is a product of, obviously, like you said, Trevion Henderson. And at the time of Dallin Hayden's recruiting, it was like, man, Richard Young, 2023, Trevion Henderson, 2021, he's just going to hand the baton. And now that Richard Young is drifting out of the picture, I think people and, and the 2023 running back situation is, is a little cloudy right now. I think we'll see some people coming back to Dallin Hayden and revisiting him. And then let's see what he does this year. Cause Mayan Williams was an afterthought. And then people got to see him for what, 10 carries in 2020. It's like, Ooh, this guy is, this guy's not a three star. So let's see what the reaction is to those 10 carries this year from Dallin Hayden. And then people can start to get excited about him and, and move on from, you know, he, he was outshined by Travion Henderson. Everybody was, and you know, you don't even need to worry about well, who's coming in 2022. doesn't matter. You get Travion Henderson for two more years after 2021. So, you know, there's still plenty of time to worry about it. And so he kind of, I think he went under the radar in terms of underestimating him, I mean, maybe maybe you are, maybe we are, but it he, he's got plenty of time to allow for that correction, and it only takes a couple of jukes to get everybody excited. I mean, there was a time where Lydell Ross, as a true freshman, had people excited for what was to come. Yeah, you 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 sort of get a little taste, and it's you know that it's a little bit more useful information than the spring game is, but still, you know, you're going against a lot of times the second and third team offensive line or, or you know, the second and third team defense on the other team and the ends of blowouts. And uh, yeah, Lydell Ross had a big game against what Indiana. I think he had a real big game against Indiana 
And everyone was ready, you know, every, you're looking for the next Maurice Claret, and there he is. Look, he just ran over Indiana. Not just Indiana, Tony. Jerry DiNardo, Indiana. So you know it's, you know it's good. And the thing is, that was 2001 as a true freshman when he rushed for 100 yards on, in, on Indiana. So it's like, oh man, imagine what this guy's going to do in 2002. But no, 2002 was Maurice Claret, and, and then, you know, we, we don't need to rehash that whole uh, era, but, but it wasn't great. All right, next one, and I'm glad uh, I'm glad you were going first on this one from at David Hooser one. Can you rank the ten starting quarterbacks for the season opener from 2001 to 2017? Which ones would best fit J- Brian Day's offense? And I'm going to run through them here for you, Tony. Uh, some great names on here: J.T. Barrett, Cardale Jones, Braxton Miller, Joe Bowserman, Terrell Pryor, Todd Beckman, Troy Smith, Justin Zwick, Craig Krenzel, Steve Belisari. The- Tony, there are some names on there. And as you go back in history, it feels like you're not getting better necessarily uh, on the whole as you trend uh, backwards through history, which means if we've read it the other direction, man, Ohio State quarterback play is getting way better. So that's, I guess, a good thing. So uh, do you want to do you want to rank them or do you just want to start with which ones are the best fit for Ryan Day's offense? Because I feel like that's probably a little bit of an easier question. Yeah, I think that would be easier. And then as we as people listen and view or discussed, you can rank them yourselves, I think. But this, I'll just say, this is one of the most off-putting questions we've ever had on this show. With all due respect to both the questioner and the players that we're talking about, it's different eras. Um, you know, it's like, which 1940s Buckeyes would you like to see fight an elephant? It's like, why do we have to do this stuff? I mean, I don't want to see any of that. They're They're all going to be killed by the elephant. And there's not, I mean, we know JT Barrett has played in Ryan Day's offense, did it in 2017, put up some very good numbers. And so for me, he is, he's my, 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 but then it's like, but Troy Smith. And the thing is, Troy Smith, one, has been very accurate at Ohio State, even though he only completed like 65% of his passes that season. So it's like, was he very accurate? And then he gets to the NFL and the problem he had was accuracy. So I think in Ryan Day's offense, as I'm going through this, you need accuracy. And that's why, I, again, I hate this question. No, all due respect. But for me, it's either JT or, or Troy Smith. I would like to see what Troy Smith could do with Ryan Day as his coach. Maybe that's what's going to put him over top for, for me. Because uh, I think he could do some some very good things with his accuracy in the, in the passing. So I will go. I, I think I think I'll say Troy Smith. I think Troy Smith is is pretty clear cut answer. The pretty clear cut answer to me here, because you saw J T Barrett in a Ryan Day offense, and it, well, it was not really a Ryan Day offense. It was working under Ryan Day in two thousand seventeen. So, and it was you know J T Barrett was a quarterback who had, you know, he was good at what he did, but it felt like there was a ceiling there, like that he was just not going to be a national championship caliber quarterback. The arm strength wasn't quite there. You would sometimes see him sort of questioning himself. And, you know, some of that also is the Urban Meyer offense versus the Ryan Day offense. What would he have looked like in the pure Ryan Day offense with four years of Ryan Day tutelage? We'll never know that. But I think, you know, I think based on what Troy Smith did in a Jim Tressel offense, which is several steps back from a uh, from an Urban Meyer offense, I think you could you could kind of pull him forward and you know four years under under Ryan Day he's probably a more accurate passer he's probably you know I mean the, the numbers you're putting up are probably significantly better I also would have liked to see I mean I I think it's JT and Cardale in some order there Cardale you know obviously you saw the higher ceiling that they had with Cardale Jones in there so maybe Cardale Jones is number two and JT Barrett's number three I really. You know, I, I, Braxton Miller feels a little bit like he was what he was, and he was really good at what he did. Braxton Miller feels like someone who's maybe a better Urban Meyer quarterback than a Ryan Day quarterback. The one who's really intriguing to me that, that there's a fascinating alternate history is Terrell Pryor as the number one quarterback in the nation for the class of 2020 or 2021 or whatever year you want to put him in the Ryan Day offense. What does Terrell Pryor look like with that natural athleticism? but also working with Ryan Day instead of Nick Siciliano. How different does Terrell Pryor turn out as a passer, as a player overall? You know, I mean, Terrell Pryor in the NIL era. 
I mean, that's a whole separate conversation. But, you know, you I think you might have potentially the biggest jump there, but there's not a guarantee. Troy Smith feels like more of a sure thing to me than Terrell Pryor in this in a, in a Ryan Day offense. But I mean, you you keep making faces at me. So what do you what do you think? Where am I wrong? No, no, no. And the thing is, like, I'm where is Terrell Pryor in a Ryan Day offense? He's at the X receiver. <laughs> That's that's kind of what I think. Where, because if if he comes to Ohio State and it's Ryan Day, yeah, you, you a lot like they did with Torrance Gibson in twenty fifteen. You give him a shot at quarterback, but the the arm strength, the accuracy, I, I don't know that he had it for this offense. Um, I I would probably go with Todd Beckman ahead of Pryor uh, ahead of um, Braxton, maybe not Pryor. I don't, see again, do not care for this question. Um, <laughs> But the because Braxton, like like I said, I would have Todd Beckman ahead of him, and and it's crazy that you know it is like who who is your number four guy then? Because mine is probably Beckman, because again, like I, I don't know that I, I see Terrell Pryor having that that accuracy uh, where it needs to be, and it doesn't need necessarily be downfield. It's you know short passes intermediate i don't but again i'll go back to the same thing like then you said it i'll say it like that i say with troy smith all of these guys are going to get considerably better under ryan day than under anybody else they had and and, and so you have to kind of give them some bonus points for that and and don't remember them as they were but make them a little bit better in your mind uh so I mean, Trail Pryor would be intriguing in any offense in any era, uh, but again, I I I also think he would be. Uh, I mean, he played in the NFL as a quarterback for a little while before he moved to receiver. Like Ryan Day could work with him, but I also think he could have caught like in this in this offense. What kind of numbers does he put up as a wide receiver? You know, six five, two hundred twenty pounds, running a four three, like. You know, is he catching 85 passes for 1,400 yards? I think yes. Uh, I'm going to correct you on one thing there. Uh, what were his measurables? 6'5 and what? Two, 220. 220. Uh-huh. Well, that was early on. He's probably 235 by the by the uh-huh. end. So as an Ohio State tight end, what is Terrell Pryor's numbers? Oh, no, Tom, don't you. I mean, don't that, say that, that sounds like a Jeremy Ruckert to me, doesn't it? More athletic Jeremy Ruckert. I mean, but he played wide receiver in the NFL, so I, I think he could have done it at Ohio State as well. He, he could have, yes, but I mean that you look at the six five two thirty five type guys right now. When those guys are not playing outside receiver, those guys are playing tight end. So that's a uh, you know I, I I suspect that if that was the case, Terrell Pryor is not coming to Ohio State because Terrell Pryor wants to be the quarterback, and uh, then he goes and plays quarterback for Rich Rod at uh, what Louisiana Monroe. Well, that probably doesn't happen either. So, mm. and well, is there really much of a difference between being the quarterback at Ohio State and being the tight end at Ohio State? Come on, <laughs> now we're just picking this. Exactly. They really, you know, there, there's a couple of guys here who I think you can kind of just sort of set aside out of hand. Joe Joe Bowserman, Craig Krenzel, Steve Belisari, like those guys, kind of are just they they were what they are. The arm strength wasn't really there. I pulled up Steve Belisari's numbers for uh, the 2001 season, his final season. Uh, Tony, give me his uh, his, uh, completion percentage uh, for 2001 uh, within 3% one direction or the other. I will say 58%. Oh, missed it by one. He's at 54%. So very sorry. Uh, Give me his touchdown to interception ratio. Tony, I will, I will remind you, this is for an entire season. Uh, what was his touchdown to interception ratio as the starting quarterback at Ohio State? I'll say 13 to 11. Mm, 10 to 7. So, yes, not quite as productive on either side there. For an entire season, Tony, an entire season, 10 touchdowns. They, they, might, they might do that in an individual game this year. Well, probably not seven interceptions, but they, they, have been, uh, they have been in the neighborhood of 10 touchdowns in, in, in a single game several times recently. So. And yeah, I would have Belisari as at the top of those three. I'd have it Belisari, Krenzel, and then Bowserman. The one that's really interesting to me is Justin Zwick, because you had him coming out of high school with so much enthusiasm, you know, so much hype, so much, and 
you know, he put up big numbers at Massillon, and then you just you never saw it at in Columbus, and that was mostly accuracy. I don't re- honestly remember his arm strength being incredible, but I think it was okay. So you know, I, it, he you know he's probably in that Todd Beckman er- area maybe for me. I mean, is, is he behind Beckman for? I mean, again, you're looking at this with what is he with Ryan Day tutelage for three to four years, or is he someone who comes in? And he's the five star. He comes in for one year, and he, you know, he's clearly behind a couple other guys, and he immediately transfers out and goes plays for, uh, goes and plays for uh, Indiana. Yeah, he's behind Beckman for me, and I know I've told this story on on the podcast before. But I went to see Zwick play in high school against Cleveland St. Ignatius and Anthony Gonzalez. Gonzalez was a junior, and Zwick and Devin Jordan, who would, would go to Ohio State as well as a wide receiver, were seniors. That was supposed to be um, Maslin against War, um, wherever Maurice Claret played. It wasn't Warren Harding, was it? It was, was it? yes. It was. But I think St. Ignatius beat Warren Harding the week before, so instead we had to watch Anthony Gonzalez, who ended up being the best player on the field as a, as a defensive back and, and a receiver. And I was watching, you know, we're, we're in the end zone watching Justin's wick, and, you know, it, it was a December, November, December game and the weather wasn't great, but it wasn't bad because we were there watching it. And I really was not impressed with the arm strength, just watching the ball flutter. And and then uh, he he gets to Ohio state and, you know, he, he, he didn't really see, he had the one game against Marshall in 2004 throws for 300 yards. But I I think, um, I think he was used to the short passing game. So that would give him an advantage. I think Beckman had a stronger arm. So that's why I would, go with them. I think maybe Beckman had a little more, more mobility as well, but Beckman also had some of those, like, what the heck are you doing kind of throws where he's getting sacked. He's like, you know what? I'm just going to, whatever happens, happens. I give it to God and let's see what happens. And, and there was, there was just, I mean, there's a lot of that with all of these quarterbacks. You got to remember if you're porting Todd Beckman forward in history, uh, Todd Beckman is not does not have the same level of Anthony Morelli exposure that he does uh, playing against Penn State, which probably leads to some of the YOLO ball that you saw. So that's uh, that's something you got to factor in there as well. As Tony said, this is a very complicated question. We're involving time traveling and uh, alternate histories and uh, Anthony Morelli exposure. So yeah, there's there's a lot that goes into this one. Uh, here's one that hopefully is a little easier for Tony to answer from at Don Suskind. Uh, Don Suskind. Uh, will we see Ohio State run mainly, mainly a 4-3 defense against Notre Dame? Seems like they'll bring the heavy offensive package. You know, it, it's going to be interesting to see how Notre Dame attacks Ohio State. I was on with Mark Rogers a couple of weeks ago, and he brought in a Notre Dame writer. And I I asked him, you know, do you, is this better or worse for, for Notre Dame to open the season with Ohio State? Because I would think both teams would want a buffer game, like a, a pre preseason game where they can write some wrongs and just get a look at what they have. But he brought it up and brought up an interesting, interesting point that he thinks it's a little advantageous for Notre Dame because nobody really knows what to expect offensively. You know, they'll have a new quarterback, um, new running back, not necessarily new offense because they, they still have what Tommy Reese as the quarterback coach slash offensive coordinator. So there's going to be some, some familiarity there, but there is mystery there, which I think helps Notre Dame, but is, is mystery more important than being sound and, and knowing what you are and what you have and knowing getting the bad guys out of the lineup basically before it's too late. But I would expect you know, everybody is, is a, is one tight end, three receivers, you know, 11 personnel, Right now, so I don't, I don't know that I see um, a heavy offensive package from Notre Dame. Now they'll play twelve personnel, but they also have some good athletes at that position. Where similar to what Jim Knowles has said about the Big Twelve, where their their eleven, their twelve personnel can look a lot like eleven personnel, and and that's where you get in trouble. So I would think you're going to see Jim Knowles' defense four two five, and then then you make adjustments as necessary. But I think you prepare for you put your defense out there and then and even then like they don't want the the, Jim Knowles doesn't want his defense being dictated to they want to be as he says we play offense on defense so that's what I expect to see 
Yeah, and you know, I don't think you're going to see they're, they're not going to be Iowa, they're not going to be Penn or you know, Wisconsin. That seems like where you might see the 4-3. I I you know, I, I would I, I I think you're you're not going to see a wild uh, you know, a you know, Notre Dame coming out and running the triple or anything like that. It, you know, they're going to be it's the same coordinator. They have a different quarterback, but you know, to your point is you know, who, do you think Notre Dame uh, prefers having the uh, the uncertainty of a quarterback, or do you think they'd rather have C.J. Stroud playing quarterback for them? Tony, uh, I don't want to presume to answer for someone else, but I'm going to guess that if you offered Tommy Reese uh, C.J. Stroud right now, he would probably say yes. So, yeah, they, there there is some uncertainty there, but yeah, I'm I'm with you there. I think that's a you're going to see Ohio State come out in the base defense. You may get a change of pace from Notre Dame. Maybe they go heavy at some point. You know, they they had uh, you have seen teams do that in the past where you'll just have there was a year that, uh, you know, uh, Texas ran the 18 wheeler package with uh, Tyrone swoops at quarterback. And it was just kind of like the the wildcat package. And you did that as a change of pace. There was a couple of years ago, Ohio State went to Nebraska and Nebraska just went I formation one drive and went right down the field in Ohio State. And it's like, that's a change of pace. OK, that works for one drive. And then, you know, you figure it out and then you got to do something else. So, yeah, I, I think you're you're going to see way more four two five than you do uh, four three against Notre Dame and probably just everyone else on the schedule this year for Ohio State. Uh, next one for about another Notre Dame assistant coach. Uh, also from Don Suskind, uh, did Greg Madison provide cover for Al Washington? They came in together. Greg had a linebacker coaching role for 2019 and 2020 before the wheels came off the linebacker group. Obviously, the talent changed, but the same linebackers who struggled last year may end up being terrific with Knowles. Did Washington get exposed without Madison? To me, Tony, I mean, first of all, obviously the talent changed. That's, that is a sentence that is doing a tremendous amount of lifting there. When you uh, get away from Justin Hilliard and Baron Browning, and Pete Werner and Tuff Borland, those were veteran guys who'd played a ton of football. Pete Werner was one of the best rookie linebackers in the NFL last year. That's, you know, you replace those guys with a guy who was playing running back in the spring. It's like, yeah, you're going to have a little bit of a drop off, I think. So that that is probably numbers one, two, and uh, two and a half on that list to me of reasons why the linebacker play wasn't what it was. And then as far as, you know, they may end up being terrific with Knowles. Yeah. Uh-huh. So now I think you're going to see far better linebacker play this year. I don't know that I put any of that on Al Washington's plate. Maybe, maybe some if you want to, but I think the upgrade, first of all, the downgrade from, you know, a extremely veteran, extremely experienced, extremely talented linebacker core to one where they had a bunch of injuries last year. You have a guy who had to switch positions over the summer like that's that's a big drop off in talent. And then I think all of a sudden this year, you got a lot of those guys back. They're all, you know, more of them are healthy this year. And you've got the Jim Knowles factor this year. I expect, you know, I don't know if they're going to be quite as good as the 2019 linebackers are, were. If they were, that's probably an, you know, incredible piece of uh, news for the uh, for the Buckeyes. Um you know, the 2019 and 2020 linebacker play, if if that if they're back at that level, that's probably huge for this team. But if they're even approaching that level, you know, a, a significant step forward from 2021, I think a lot of that goes on, number one, Jim Knowles is a defensive coordinator as opposed to Kerry Combs and Matt Barnes. And number two, all those guys, a bunch of them are potentially healthy. A bunch of them now are a little more experienced. Tommy Eichenberg has another year of experience. Steel Chambers has a year of experience under his belt. Can Cody Simon get healthy? If Cody Simon's healthy, that gives him another guy. I mean, you, you're bringing in Chip Trainum. You've got all these different pieces. You've got the really talented young guys, CJ Hicks, Gabe Powers. Like, there's just so much talent there that now is a little more experienced, working for a better defensive coordinator. I, I, I don't know how much, if any, to put on Al Washington because it seems like there's so many other things you can point at there. Yeah, I don't put any of it on Al Washington. That 2019 team also had Malik Harrison. And you know he he led the team and oh, oh one of the one of the most underrated Buckeyes who then I managed to forget in this conversation yeah good good job me and uh, yes one of one of the most underrated Buckeyes of the last decade I think yeah so they've they've had some linebacker talent and remember Greg Madison was the Sam's and Bullet coach like he had no position his first you know first few months on a job and then got got bored with it and asked to take over the Sam's and, and the Bullet and so uh, you know how much of he, Pete Werner was great as the Sam in 2019. Go ahead and give Greg Madison credit there if you want and take it from Al Washington. But like the 2020 linebackers, what they got out of Justin Hilliard and 
and tough Borland and say what you want. You know, we're not talking about coverage linebackers. That's not what your middle linebacker is. Um, you know, Pete Werner was great. Baron Browning had, had, had a career year where, um, yeah, I don't put any of that on, on Al Washington because hey, remember, and then the, the, the guys they signed in 2018, Dallas Gant, Cape on Pope and Taraji Mitchell to bolster the talent and the depth. And, and we saw what has happened with there. So yeah, no, um, and, and it, it will be interesting because I think the linebackers are going to be a lot better. And if they're at 29 or 29, 2019 or 2020 levels, that would be insane. And then people will be like, well, thank God they got rid of Al Washington. And it's like, well, I think, you know, it's, it's the whole correlation causation that you talk about, Tom. And I think that's uh, in, in evidence with, with this uh, situation um, there. I was just about to say correlation causation. I'm so glad you listen when I talk. This is so exciting. I had no idea. This is Well, fantastic. I read the transcripts. I read the transcripts. <laughs> I don't actually listen while it's being spoken. Don't. Don't. Just don't. Just just don't. All right. Last one from at Van Gogh underscore zero. <laughs> Best sports cartoon based on real life players. And Tony, these first the first three, I think you were much more familiar with than I am. I have some thoughts on the uh, the fourth one that are probably the same as your thoughts, but uh, Pro Stars, which is Jordan, Bo, and Gretzky, Game of Zones. Um, I remember that one with dragons, not uh, not real players. Uh, Scooby Doo with the Harlem Harlem Globetrotters, and then Random Simpsons episodes with pro athletes. I, I mean, I, I think there is a very clear number one on this list to me. But uh, Tony, uh, what is what is your list? Well, I do remember Pro Stars. It was not great. It was Michael Jordan, Bo uh, Jackson, and Wayne Gretzky like solving crimes of some sort. Um, probably sports based. I don't know. It, it, it was fine. Game of Zones. I have no idea what that was about. So we can we can strike that from the list. Uh, now the Scooby Doo with the Harlem Globetrotters. I don't know if you know, my family. We were just talking about this uh, on Mother's Day, and it's what we get together and we talk about. Like, hey. Remember that Scooby Doo episode of this? And, you know, it's hours upon hours of fun, especially as we're waiting three hours in the sun to get into a Texas roadhouse. But the, the Harlem Globetrotters is very underrated here because whenever they need something, one of the guys would just pull it out of his afro. And it's like, if we just had a blender right now, oh, oh boom, blender. Like, so there is some supernatural power going on there that can solve. Most issues, it's kind of like the Wonder Twins. Like, oh, what do we need? I have form of a bucket of water. I'll be a mop or I'll be an eagle. And boom, we've solved the, the day. And uh, the Globetrotters, one of them had that ability. So I, I think I think we need to keep that in mind. However, they are still second to what we both agree is number one. Yeah, number one with a bullet here is the uh, Springfield Nuclear Power Plant softball team episode of The Simpsons. I, I don't think there's even a conversation here. That was number one. So many great players, so many players on that, you know, in that one episode. And then so many great, like, little mini storylines. It was like the 22 short stories about Springfield episode, except centered around pro athletes. And, you know, Ozzie Smith falls into the Springfield mystery spot. Uh, Wade Boggs gets punched by uh, by Barney Gumble after uh, or, or arguing over Lord Palmer Stan. Uh, Steve Sachs gets uh, arrested for murder and uh, <laughs> by the crack Springfield uh, Police Department. Uh, you know Ken Griffey Jr. with the uh, the head the the tonic that shrunk that grew his head. Uh, Jose Canseco rescuing the stuff out of the house and uh, yeah the dryer goes on actually the dryer goes on the left. Uh, I mean just like so many great storylines. And, you know, and then it ends up with uh, Homer having to win the game. And, uh, you know, I'm sure I'm sure I'm spoiling this for someone who has not watched a 30 year old cartoon at this point. But uh, Homer saves the day in the most Homer way possible. Uh, you have all the great Mr. Burns lines about, uh, you know, Mr. Burns, you know, showing them the signals, the you know, the, the signs. Uh, I mean, it's just it's just so great. Smithers, uh, you know, <laughs> Mr. Burns would have like Honus Wagner on his initial list of uh, players. Sir, your your third base has been dead since the 1870s. It, just so many, so many great lines. I think that's number one by the widest of margins here. There are a couple other good ones. I mean, the Joe Namath uh, one where he's, uh, you know, he's got vapor lock. Uh, that one, that one was good. Uh, setting your watch to Bart Starr's haircut. That's a pretty good, you know, Bart Starr didn't actually appear in the episode, I don't think, but uh, you can set you set your uh, watch to Bart Starr's haircut. There's been a few other good ones, but 
yeah, to me, to me, the uh, Homer at the bat episode is not, I mean, I don't think this is even really a conversation. I, um, there, there is so much with, with that one. Mike Sosa just wanting to work at the power plant. Like he was happy. <laughs> like this is the, like all he's ever wanted in his life. The, how many times over the course of a year do you say, and I said, get rid of those sideburns, you know, the, the, <laughs> the Mr. Burns and Don Mattingly feud about the sideburns. Uh, another, another one was Daryl strawberry in this episode is just like <laughs> the, the mo the nicest guy, the biggest kiss, butt, the Brown noser. And you know, like uh, Burns is out there talking and he's like, yeah, no hustle either. Skip, you know, just like being a real, <laughs> Uh, and, and that's the guy who takes, you know, he takes Homer's place basically. And then of course, <laughs> Mr. Burns pulls him. Is it a lefty lefty matchup where he, that's where he decides to pinch hit Homer for, uh, yeah, yeah, some, something, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, that is, uh, the answer, uh, 100 out of 100 times, one of the all time great Simpsons episodes and, uh, still holds up even though all of those players now are, um, even too old to manage, basically, <laughs> as we're, you know, get to that point. And I'm pretty sure Steve Sachs is still in prison. So that's pretty bad. <laughs> I did. My, my favorite line there was uh, a lot of murders. Hey, where, where are you from? New York? Hmm. A lot of murders in New York City. Hey, sexy boy. <laughs> oh, the, <laughs> Lou, Lou and Eddie doing some of their best work. That's that's not the same episode as, as where it's like, you don't know when to quit, do you? That was exactly the same episode. That was maybe the next line. Yes. But there's hundreds of unsolved murders in New York City. You don't know when to quit, do you, sexy boy? That's so good. Um, all right. That should do it for this episode. Uh, Tom and I are going to stop, and we're just going to do some more talking about The Simpsons, and then we'll, you know, we'll get back to recording another show eventually. But that will do it for today. Thank you guys for all of the questions. As always, uh, you bail us out. You, you help us out uh, bigly. And this time of year, so I want to thank you for that. Uh, also, make sure to check out the rest of the shows here at the Buckeye Scoop. Tom with the Morning Scoop, Alex with Around the Oval, Kevin Noon with the Big Me Kickoff, and Mark Givler and Bill the Bank Green with the Gives in the Bank. They talk uh, recruiting. So give those a, a listen. Check them out on all of your podcast platforms of choice or YouTube as well. And do that. And uh, we'll talk to you guys later. Thanks. <laughs>